Gospel of John, chapter 20. And this will be part two. Talking about the last 40 days of Jesus being here on the earth physically. Chapter 20, verse 19. Please follow as I read. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when you had, excuse me, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. May God bless the reading of His Word. You can be seated. The resurrection is the most important event in the history of mankind. That's it. Nothing else can come close or compare. Nothing else changed the landscape of our history or of our, of our lives than, than Jesus coming and dying and rising again. But after Jesus rose, the stone was rolled away and Jesus conquered the tomb. He hung around for 40 days. And different things happen. We, last week we talked about six very specific meetings Jesus had with one or more of, of the folks that were part of the following. Mary Magdalene was the first one there by the tomb. And then the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus went with them, talked with them, sat down to eat with them. The disciples without Thomas that we just read about and the disciples with Thomas. And we're going to talk a little more about Thomas here in a moment. And then the disciples, when they went fishing, and then we talked about the Mount of Olives when Jesus ascended, that he had all of those different meetings during that 40 days. But I want you to notice with me this. For, for those 40 days and for the kinds of things we've just now read about, we don't see a lot of the other things that we normally saw in Jesus' ministry. Um, there wasn't any record of Jesus healing people after the resurrection. We don't read that. There's actually, a, a, for 40 days of Jesus' ministry, there's only 142 verses of Scripture. And most of them talk more about the resurrection than any of the events that took place during those 40 days. So I wanted, I wanted you to see 
that we don't have a clear perspective of everything that happened in those 40 days. Uh, there's lots of things that could have been written, but even at the end of the, of the Gospels, he said, uh, we could have written more, but it would have filled up all the books that mankind would ever have if we read everything that Jesus did. Well, last week we talked about Jesus appearing to the disciples, and we talked a little bit about Jesus empowering the disciples. We talked about Peter. I, I want to make this statement to you. I want you to think about this. Peter needed help getting past his past. Anybody else have a uh, rather... Um, Eventful past, is that a nice way to say it? <laughs> Any of you have a, uh, a, a past that, you know, there are pieces of it you just want to forget, wipe it out, put it somewhere else? Yeah. yeah. Now just, to, yeah, raise both hands. Um, Romans tells us we've all sinned and fallen short of God's plan for us. When we come to the reality of that we were created by God and that God wants to save us and walk with us, and we start looking at how, how much sin defines who we are, When someone truly comes to that knowledge, they can't help but be saved. Because there's only one way out of that sinful mess. There's only one way to recover all the, the years and all the things that we did, and that's to get Jesus' forgiveness. But we have all sinned. By the way, as I, and I recognize sitting in this, in this crowd, most of us, if not all of us, are believers. Let's say most of us are that we've accepted Christ and that we've had our sins forgiven. But I want to remind you for a moment that we are still sinners who are saved by grace. And although we are cleansed from all unrighteousness, we go out and find more unrighteousness. Some of us would like to blame it on others and say, nope, that unrighteousness followed me. I didn't go after that. <laughs> but you looked. You stopped and let it catch up with you. You gave it your attention. Sinner. By the way, let's, so you don't misunderstand anything? Sinner. And while... We would like to become holy. We still battle with sin. The old nature rises up against the new nature who is Jesus. And for some of us, that old nature had a long time to imprint on us. That old nature. And so even though we may believe in Jesus Christ and we may have His forgiveness, we still battle with the issue of sin. The good news is, us, as Christians, sinning does not disqualify us from heaven. We, we sin, and we are going to be displeasing to our Father. Any of you as parents ever get mad at your kids? I'm a, all you that didn't raise your hand, I'm going to give it to you because I saw you smirking. They, uh, our kids can disappoint us, but we don't quit loving them. God doesn't quit loving you because you sinned. Doesn't mean He's happy with you. Doesn't mean. By the way, when your kids when your kids were behaving badly, did you go ahead and bless them anyway and give them all kinds of special treatment and and extra money for their allowance and. No, as a matter of fact, it's kind of the opposite, isn't it? When, they're, when our kids are really messing up, don't we take privilege away from them? There is a reason that God called Himself our Heavenly Father. 
And the reason is he wanted us to know that just like a father, he loves us unconditionally. But also like a father, if you keep messing up, he's going to be disappointed in you. And then there comes some discipleship that sounds a lot like discipline and feels like you just got whooped by your daddy. I still believe. It has to have some firm boundaries so that it never crosses over into abuse. But I go by what the scripture says in Proverbs, that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. So, that being said, our Heavenly Father gets disappointed in us. And I I love that Jesus paid some special attention to Thomas and to Peter in, in, in these accounts. Thomas, we know him as Doubting Doubting Thomas. And we started to talk about him last week, but I just want to go over it again so it's fresh in our minds and and a a little bigger picture. Thomas not only doubted whether Jesus appeared to all the other disciples, but Thomas made a rather brash and harsh statement. He said, He said, I'm not going to believe because you guys say you saw him. I'm only going to believe when I see his hands and put my finger in the nail print in his hands. And when I see his side and I can put my hand in his side. That's the only way I'm going to believe, guys. Just for the record, that's not faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, not the substance of things you touch. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that you cannot see. Since Thomas was basing his belief on that one faith. He was going to believe when he saw. And Jesus said, you're blessed, Uh, Thomas. You saw me and you believe. I just want to read to you. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. I'm going to tell you, that's a good blessing though, amen. Because believing is what has to happen before we are redeemed from our sin. Believing has to happen before we have an address in heaven. So believing, Thomas got that. But then Jesus went on to say, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me, by the way. I think it's cool that Jesus in his statements makes sure that here 2,000 years later when we read the scripture, we could almost, and, and literally, we could almost put our name in there. Blessed. Are you James because you believe even though you haven't seen? And Leroy and Tim. Tim's a new believer, by the way. Yes to Jesus. He he followed Christ for all God and now he's he's committing his life back to the Lord. And he's gonna be baptized in just a little while. Knew that he was one of those people that needed God to be in charge and when we met this week we prayed about that and talked about baptism and he wants everybody to know that he's he's dying to his old self to live for Jesus when we believe that's really what we do is set aside our old nature and so when our old nature starts taking over that means that something dead is trying to take over your living body that the prospect of that doesn't sound all that good to me how about you but Jesus and and said, Thomas, can you imagine? I mean, the grace that 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 represents. Here's also something else it represents. God has done everything. Jesus has done all that's required that you might be saved. And if you need, if you need some some special understanding, some help. I would challenge you, just pray and say, God, I'm working on this, but I need your help. And I believe, with all of my heart, I believe that God will show Himself to you in a very special way. (laughs) And God will become evident. If you're looking, if if you have hope of, of heaven and you start looking for God to speak to you, He will. Sometimes it comes out of His Word as He spoke to us and it was recorded and the Holy Spirit made sure it was right. So we believe this is without errors. 
And we know that, that when we read this, the Word comes alive to us because the Holy Spirit. And so when we read this and it starts talking about us, it might even as you, especially when you're reading Proverbs, you think, man, how did he know that's how I was going to be feeling today? Because he's God, amen? And he put the Word in there for that day, for today, so that you and I could trust in him. Peter had a hard time getting past his past. I really like that because, you know, we struggle with the same thing. Anybody here battle with guilt? Anybody here battle with uh, uh, burning bridges in your relationships? Um, well, you know, I could go on making a list. I don't think I will. Because <laughs> I, I don't want to put you on the spot about your past. But God wants to, because He wants you to confess your sin. Can you imagine Peter in that room when Jesus appeared? And he saw Him, and he remembered that he denied Jesus three times. And then the second time that Jesus met with the disciples, when Thomas was there, and Jesus spoke to Thomas and said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. There's a bunch of people going to be blessed because they believe without seeing. And I can imagine Peter saying, gosh, I wish he would help me with, with my past, with my problem. And then Peter finally just kind of says, many commentaries say he just kind of gave up. This whole ministry gig is, you know, going away. Jesus is changing everything. None of it's the way he thought it would be, and so he just went back to fishing. Jesus met him there. And as I and Peter had a chance to recoup. He had a chance to reconcile with Jesus his love for him. And so his greatest memory now was not the denial, but the fact that Jesus stood there and spoke to him about what was in his heart. And I believe this morning that many of us, us, many of us have issues in our heart that we need God to help us with. We've tried to, to just pray and we've tried to uh, get counsel, at least a lot of people do, but we have these great big old wounds on the inside of us and we can't reconcile it. We've tried to fix it, it doesn't fix. A lot of you have that circumstance right there freshly in your thoughts right now. And it's not because I got up here and tried to talk you into it, but it's because God wants to deal with you. He wants to help you deal with the problem. He came to give us life, not just life, not just average life, but abundant life. He you say, Pastor, it's not about my unrighteousness, it's about the person that hurt me, their unrighteousness. Yep, but now it's about your unforgiveness. Come on. And by the way, unforgiveness, you're not going to hurt the person that you're not forgiving, by the way. I would, I would venture to say most of them don't even know you're still mad. So you're the only one that has the problem with the, the wound and the anger. And it's buried deep. And it's not coming out easy, but the one that's hurting is you. Yeah. And so you need to find a way to forgive and let go of that account. You need to find a way to say, God, help me forgive that person of that terrible thing. Now, God can do that. Yeah. First, I want you to note this, though. God can and will forgive that person if they talk to God, not if they talk to you. Their forgiveness of what they did, in relationship to you, yes, you have control of that. In relationship to God, nope, you don't have control of that. God's going to forgive them if they will confess their sins. God will be faithful to forgive them their sins and cleanse them of all unrighteousness. You and I like Peter, need to reconcile our part. 
And then we need to forgive that other person. Otherwise, their wound is still taking over your life, and the hurt will still be there, and it's a result of you not forgiving, not of them being that bad of a person or causing that deep of a wound. God can heal any wound that we have, any one of us. He can help us overcome the, the times that we've been hurt so terribly. God can do that if you let Him. But if you choose to hold the account against that person, the same way you're judging that person, the Bible says, is how God's going to judge you. And if you're not going to forgive that person, then God's not going to be forgiving you. Not until you straighten it out. And by the way, that's not my interpretation. That's Scripture. Jesus came to empower them to walk in their forgiveness and in their new life, not hung up on the old one. Jesus also came back to make it very clear to them. This is number three in your notes. We filled in the first two for you because I started talking about them last week. The third one is Jesus made known to His disciples, He is risen. <laughs> Early disciples, they would greet each other. And they'd say, He is risen. And the response is, He is risen indeed. Then they know they're talking to another believer. It's kind of like a secret code. Just like our secret handshake. You do know the secret handshake, don't you? <laughs> no, there's no secrets. It's not even a secret. As a matter of fact, the, the best news, the most incredible thing that ever could happen in this world, uh, that by faith you can believe in Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins and forgiven, and then you have eternal life, that's not a secret, nor is it a nor is it a mystery. God provided that for us so we could be saved. Amen. But I want you to think for just a minute about these disciples who lived there, and they watched Jesus die. If you've seen the movie The Passion, it's, it's, a, it's way too realistic. And, and I would tell you that, that kids, young kids don't need to see it. I mean, you parents make your own judgment, but it, and it stirs our hearts because we see uh, a representation of Jesus, our Savior, taking the punishment that well, they, they were pretty real with. It. It, it looks real, and it does depict what happened to him. But because it's a movie, we know that's not what happened to the person on that screen. So I can only imagine how much harder it was for all these disciples to be somewhere in that crowd watching Jesus be beaten and as best as they could cause shame to Him and to everybody that was related to Jesus. They, the, that's what the whole goal of the crucifixion was, to shame that person and everybody that knows that person. But to be watching that from the crowd, Peter didn't do anything. As a matter of fact, during the crucifixion, it says that all the disciples ran away and hid. Because I want this message to stir your heart, I want to challenge you. Sometimes we run away and hide instead of serving God. Do you ever think, maybe that person who's standing in line with you, do you ever have thought, maybe they... You need to tell them about Jesus or, or at least invite them to church or do something to bring Jesus, you know, and make them aware of Him. When you don't do it is when you run away and hide. The disciples ran away and hide. They watched Him die. Because they watched Him die, because many of them saw Him taken into the tomb... They didn't need science. They didn't need the crime scene investigators. They didn't need anybody to prove to them or show them that he was dead. Amen. They saw it. Now, an interesting article I read in, read in a counseling magazine is that the, the ability for the disciples to take, 
to take and make a story. Here's, here's what many people said. Even back there, the Roman government tried to say, it's a hoax. Jesus really didn't die on the cross. Somebody stole uh, his, or excuse me, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just looked like he did, and then they snuck him off so that they could bring him back later and say he rose from the dead. That's one version. Another version is that Jesus really did die, and he didn't come back from the dead. They just took his body and hid it, and so there's really no Jesus. So the, the world, the devil, and many of just men, when all this happened, have tried to deny Jesus. Our society still denies Jesus. Oh, no, that's just the only reason people talk about God and Jesus is because they're too weak to face life on their own. Amen. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. You know what? I don't care how they label it. I'm the one with peace, and they're not. Amen. I'm the one with hope, and they're not. <laughs> I recognize that if it really was a lie, it would have been proven and died out long, long time ago. And if it were a fraud of some sort or another, how would you explain these disciples becoming martyrs? They had a way out. All they had to do is say, no, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe he rose from the dead. And they weren't going to kill him or feed him to the lions. Do you believe John was boiled and he survived? And yet he could still write Revelation? Wow. Man. If it were a fraud, the most incredible thing happened that more than just one person, we're talking about literally hundreds of people who believe Jesus rose from the dead, gave up their life and died believing in and telling the story of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, how do you live out your faith? Do you recognize that Jesus rose up from the dead? Do, do, not only do you believe it, do you live that way? Because see, here's the cool thing. <laughs> Think about the appearances that Jesus made. He came into that room where the disciples were hiding because they were afraid of the Jews or the Romans and they were sitting in that room with the door locked and Jesus showed up how is it that we as Christians think we can just hide out at our home and not really serve God and not really do anything and you shut the door so nobody's gonna bother you, you don't answer the phone when the church is calling or the pastor or any other since since you have caller ID you don't have to answer you can even quit going to church and at some point, you know, we're going we're gonna to figure that if, if you're not going to come to church, then, you know, we don't have the chance to minister to you, so we'll just pray for you, and we'll just wait for you to take the next step. But if you think you can hide from God, you need to think about this a little bit further, because Jesus came into that room with the door locked, not once, but at least twice. And by the way, even a big stone in front of a tomb didn't keep him locked up. And then Jesus just appeared to the guys on the road to Emmaus. And then he disappeared when the evening was done. <laughs> you can't hide from him. You can even run off and go to some other part of the county or country. Peter said, let's go fishing. Let's just go back to the way of life that we knew. You can't go back. Jesus met him there. Now, he showed all kinds of grace, didn't he? He fed him dinner for He said, hey, it's time for y'all to get busy ministering. Peter, do you love me? Do you? Do you love Jesus? Do you believe he's risen? Do we live that way? Life can only be lived one day at a time. All of your yesterdays and all of your tomorrows are out of reach. But it's tempting to try and drag the remnants of your past right along with you all the way into your tomorrow. 
Maybe even you might try to pull your yesterdays into heaven. The problem is yesterday is too heavy of a load for you to carry around with you. It has already consumed enough of your time, energy, and emotions the first time around. Why let it steal any more of the resources of your life that are at your disposal, but only for today? Put yesterday in its place, behind you, where it belongs. If it hurts, if it makes your heart ache, then you need to take, take it to God. And you need to talk to God about your yesterdays that you just can't let go of. And if in your conversation with God as you pray, you struggle still with your yesterdays, then you need to get somebody, a pastor, a counselor, a teacher, somebody who can walk with you enough to help you let go of yesterdays. By the way, even the good yesterdays can hold us back. Did you ever hear this from, huh. ever hear this around any church? Well, I've done my part. Now it's up to them others to take and do their turn. The voice of a quitter. Somebody retiring from God's service before you're allowed to. <laughs> You ever hear anybody say, oh, just leave it for him? <laughs> okay, let's try this out. Just leave it for Jerry. He'll get to it. <laughs> if you don't know who Jerry is, he's our custodian. <laughs> Folks, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, I don't believe there'd be any martyrs. But because Jesus did rise from the dead, because Jesus sat in the company of his disciples, he sat and ate with them. It's not that Jesus rose and they saw a spirit. They were looking at the real deal because Jesus, Jesus had meals with them. Jesus showed up with them. They could touch him. Jesus is real. Amen. And they gave their life to serve him. And God's calling us to do the same thing. He's calling us to live all the days of our life for Him. Well, some of you probably need to get into more ministry. Some of you need to stay at your secular job because God has you there to be a minister to the people you work with. But everything in your life should be lived as unto the Lord. So here's our challenge today and our invitation. Some of you need to figure out a way to get your past behind you. And I would love for some of our pastors and deacons and teachers to pray with you and help you get some of that behind you. Once you start learning how to get that behind you, you can start applying it to every one of them when the devil starts to remind you of your past that you don't like or that stops you from doing what you should do then you have learned how to pray and you have learned that you can call on somebody and together you can start putting it behind you. We need to pray. Some of you need to become desperate because it has put you in handcuffs. It's given you sorrow. It's making it hard for you to, to live life and to believe that you could be loved not only by God but by others. And so you live a life of misery and loneliness and God doesn't like that because He loves you and he wants to bless you. And he created a church so that you could have a family and face the memory of tomorrow, but face today in his strength. So we're going to have an invitation. Jackie's going to come. She's going to play. And while she's playing, I would like you to respond to Jesus. Maybe right there where you're at, you can pray and say, Lord, I need to get some things behind me so that I can come and serve you. The only way to do that, the Bible says, is for us to pray and talk to Him. If that's been a struggle for you, then if there's somebody next to you that you, that you care for, that they, they would know how to pray with you, just grab their hand and say, would you pray with me? And if not, then you could come and I would, without us telling any stories, 
I, I will put you with somebody that can pray with you. But the other thing about putting yesterday behind you is focusing your service for today and be ready to serve for tomorrow. Are you committed to do that? Are you committed to live your life out, even living your life sacrificially for the Lord? By the way, Paul wrote to the Romans and said, that's your reasonable service, to dedicate your entire life, the rest of it, serving God in whatever you do. Let's stand together. You come. Let's pray and do this with the Lord. Thank you.